Opioid drugs are narcotic analgesics. They reduce pain without producing unconsciousness. At least the intention is not to produce unconsciousness. Narcotic means inducing stupor and analgesic means reducing pain. Narcotic analgesics create a sense of relaxation and sleep. Of course, at high doses, they can induce coma and death. They're the best painkillers known and they also produce a sense of euphoria. Polydrug users and the polyaddicted, those people with intense experience with multiple substances, tend to describe opioids like oxycodone as the most addictive of the substances. Opium is an extract of the poppy plant, Papaver somniferum. Most comes from Southeast Asia, India, China, Iran, Turkey, and Southeastern Europe. Opiates have been used recreationally and in medicine for thousands of years. Opiate refers to chemicals from an actual opium plant. Opioids includes opiates and synthetic versions, for example, oxycodone. Pictured here is the potentially fatal dose of fentanyl for a male of average size. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. It doesn't take much. And another synthetic opioid is carfentanyl, which is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Why would we need something 10,000 times more powerful than heroin to tranquilize animals, apparently? Medical or medicinal opium goes back to 1680s England, and likely a lot farther than that. Thomas Sydenham in 1680 named his mixture of opium and wine laudanum, meaning a thing to be praised. A typical recipe for laudanum was opium, alcohol, cinnamon, and saffron, and it was used for pain and cough. Another popular opium medicine was pergoric, which was opium, alcohol, morphine, glycerin, and a few other ingredients, which was used as an anti-diarrheal. Opium, as a medicine, saved many people's lives who would have died from dysentery, intestinal infections, from diarrhea, and liquid loss. But it was also a bit more popular than it needed to be, as people used it for sleep, headaches, and the common cough, and laudanum in particular was mixed with other remedies. The main active chemical in opium is morphine. It was isolated in the early 1800s, the first time an active ingredient of any medicinal plant was isolated. This allowed doctors to prescribe it in known dosages, a big first for apothecary medicine. We tend not to think twice about the fact that all of the Tylenol capsules in a given bottle have the same amount of acetaminophen in them. But back before we isolated the active ingredients in our drugs, we only knew approximately how much we were getting with each dose. Subsequent standardization of products is how large drug companies like Bayer could take over the corner apothecary business. You knew what you were getting from Bayer. You could trust the big bottle of Bayer heroin to babysit your kids while you had a nice ether nap. Bayer heroin was marketed specifically as cough medicine for children. This was from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. So your grandparents may, as kids, have been given Bayer heroin, which was the product name for a common cough or throat irritation. Keep in mind that the oral delivery would be, not be nearly as addicting or euphoria-inducing as smoking or injecting, but we have plenty of records in the forms of prescription receipts that people were addicted to over-the-counter medicinal heroin. This is the Niagara Apothecary, a museum and historical building in Niagara Falls, Canada, where you can thumb through some actual prescription logs and see people requesting heroin products in increasing doses and increasing frequencies. The apothecary operated from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. It's closed right now for COVID, but check it out if you get a chance. Opium is part of many firsts in pharmacology, the first to have its active ingredient, morphine isolated, and the first to have its receptor localized. After, in the 1970s, we discovered endorphins, your body's own opioids, and naloxone. Opium also gives us codeine, thebane, narcotine, and other substances, but it was morphine and the prodrug for morphine, heroin, that are the reasons this substance has impacted so many lives. Heroin is made by adding two acetyl groups to a morphine molecule swapping out two hydrogen molecules for two acetyl or C2H3O molecules. 
making it more lipid soluble. This lipid soluble molecule enters the bloodstream and reaches the brain faster, so it's much more potent than morphine, most notably when injected. This very rapid action of heroin is responsible for its more dramatic euphoric effects compared with morphine, at least when injected. The chemical name for heroin is diacetylmorphine, and since it makes the delivery of morphine to the bloodstream more efficient, heroin is referred to as a prodrug for morphine. Both heroin and morphine are neutral in terms of charge, but the acetyl bonds on the oxygen molecules in heroin are less water soluble than the hydrogen bonds in morphine, making heroin more capable of making it undissolved up to the brain, and the acetyl bond is more lipid soluble than the hydroxyl bond, meaning it can better penetrate the lipid bilayers of cells to influence receptors. There are many other modifications of the morphine molecule structure. Some produce partial agonists, substances that bind to the receptors but have less biological effect. These are three examples. These are less potent analgesics than morphine, but have fewer side effects and less risk of dependence. In maintenance therapies for opioid addiction, like methadone maintenance, one modified morphine molecule is being used to replace and or block another. The semi-synthetic opiate buprenorphine, for example, is a safer alternative to synthetic opioid methadone, in part because users experience less respiratory depression, one potential risk or side effect of methadone maintenance therapy because proper dosing is a difficult thing to determine and clients might supplement with unplanned use. One potential risk is your nervous system getting too relaxed or depressed and forgetting to tell your lungs to breathe. This overdose effect is why so many professionals carry naloxone kits. Naloxone is what is called a pure antagonist of morphine. Another one is nalorphine. These are structurally similar molecules, but they have zero efficacy. They do not do what morphine does, but they take up its space. This can prevent or reverse the effect of opioids, potentially sending a user into withdrawal. These effects are why naloxone administration in response to suspected opioid overdose is standard care. In maintenance therapies, having a higher dose of the replacement substance, like methadone or buprenorphine, tends to lead to lower relapse rates. There is, therefore, strong clinical motivation to prescribe higher doses of the replacement substance. This is more subjectively satisfying for the client and could save them from overdose, which is a notable risk when one relapses on maintenance therapy. Buprenorphine could, and likely has, reduced overdose deaths from respiratory depression. The other reason why naloxone kits are now standard issue for health and public service professionals is that opioid addiction and overdose is a growing problem. This is referred to as the opioid crisis, the primary cause of it initially being overprescription or poor prescription maintenance of opioid painkiller. This makes a market for stronger and cheaper substances like heroin, because people now want opioids, and the growth and exploitation of this market is the second primary cause of the opioid crisis. This growth was aided by obscenely potent substances like fentanyl and carfentanil. If you're lacing a batch of heroin, cocaine, or another substance with fentanyl, then any clumps in the mixing process could produce a large number of overdose deaths in drug users who may have no idea they were even taking an opioid, never mind that it was laced with fentanyl. We can see from this Public Health Ontario data that if we go back to 2007 to 2013, the opioid most likely to be present in someone who died of an overdose was oxycodone, a prescribed substance. Starting from 2014 to present, the opioid we've been most likely to find in overdose cases is fentanyl. And not listed here is carfentanyl the new opioid 100 times the potency of fentanyl, which is also being implicated in overdose deaths. And if you are looking for OxyContin, it would be subsumed under OxyCodone. OxyContin, like Percodan, is a semi-synthetic opioid similar to morphine. OxyContin, or Oxys, became a popular street drug because they dissolve in water, which is useful for IV injection, and when crushed to eliminate the continuous time release mechanism, to which the contin refers in the name, it produced a heroin-like high. It has also tended to be relatively easy to obtain.
This is a handy breakdown of opioids with exogenous opiates on the top pyramid, the synthetic opioids in purple, and the neurotransmitters in our body, the endogenous opiates that these substances mimic in blue. Effects of opioids on the central nervous system are related to dose and rate of absorption. Low to moderate doses result in pain relief, constricted pupils, drowsiness, inability to concentrate, and morphine at this dosage could be expected to relieve anxiety, aggressiveness, and feelings of inadequacy. At higher doses, one can reach a notably abnormal state of elation or euphoria, described as a kick, or a bang, or a rush. The rush acts as a powerful reinforcer that encourages repeated drug use. There can also, of course, be adverse effects, dysphoria, restlessness, and increased anxiety, nausea, and vomiting. Morphine affects the area post rema in the medulla oblongata of your brainstem, responsible for emesis, or throwing up. At very high doses, the sedative effects of opioids may lead to unconsciousness. Body temperature and blood pressure fall, pupils become very constricted, referred to as pinpoint pupils. At this point, morphine acting on the brainstem's respiratory center can cause respiratory failure, which is the ultimate cause of death in an overdose. It was noted earlier that opiates saved plenty of lives from dysentery. Morphine affects the gastrointestinal tract by slowing it down, stopping fluid loss, and helping us survive severe bacterial and parasitic diseases of the gut. Opium and morphine have been used for this, but now they're primarily used for pain management. Unfortunately, the fact that we only want the analgesic effects does not make the constipating effects go away. When opioids are used, for pain management or otherwise, constipation is a common side effect. And this is common enough that a drug made specifically to relieve opioid-induced constipation was featured in multiple Super Bowl ad spots in 2016. It was mentioned that opium was the first psychoactive chemical to have its receptors localized in 1972. Four receptor subtypes act on neurons. These receptor subtypes have distinct distributions in the brain and spinal cord and are likely responsible for mediating a wide variety of things. The mu receptor in green has a high affinity for morphine. Locations of mu receptors best reflect the main effects of morphine. Pain relief can be attributed to action of receptors in the medial thalamus, periaqueductal gray, median RAF, and spinal cord. Effects of morphine in the reward system can be attributed to action of receptors in the nucleus accumbens. Effects like cardiovascular and respiratory depression, cough control, and nausea and vomiting can be attributed to action of receptors in the brainstem. To avoid bogging things down in details, suffice it to say that the other receptors have their own distributions across different brain areas, and these receptors have both differences and overlap in the effects they produce. Kappa receptors, for example, are found, among other places, in the striatum and may regulate pain perception and dysphoria. Opioids inhibit nerve activity in several ways. This describes three of them, but if you're not familiar with G-proteins, feel free to ignore this. All four types of opioid receptors activate G-proteins that inhibit adenylylcyclase, which normally synthesizes a second messenger that you may have heard of, cyclic AMP. But let's zoom out, since this is likely not doing much for most people's understanding of addiction. Suffice it to say, for now, that opioid drugs mimic many inhibitory actions of your own endogenous opioids in many central nervous system locations and at many stages of pain transmission. You may recall from whatever introduction to psychology course you took, especially if you took it with me, that one biological correlate of the placebo effect is the release of endogenous opioids, i.e. your body gives itself a dose of natural painkiller because it expects pain relief. Naloxone, the pure antagonist of morphine that health professionals carry with them, blocks placebo pain relief. The placebo effects people get from, for example, acupuncture, get cancelled out if we give them naloxone. The natural opioids that would have been produced and received to inhibit pain transmission do not do their job, thanks to naloxone blocking them. So what is this job exactly? Opioids regulate pain primarily by activating interneurons, which are just neurons that have their somas and synapses in the same structure. 
Opioids activate small inhibitory interneurons in the spinal cord. Here, morphine and its analogs can inhibit transmission of pain signals to higher brain centers. And going the other direction, opioids regulate pain by inhibiting excitatory interneurons in the periaqueductal gray. This is the most important descending pathway. It begins in the midbrain and can inhibit spinal cord pain transmission, making it an important target for managing chronic pain. But if opioids are just inhibiting signals, where does the euphoria come from? What makes opioids addictive? A pathway called the dopaminergic mesolimbic pathway contributes to opioid reinforcement. It originates in the ventral tegmental area of the midbrain and projects to limbic areas, including the all-important nucleus accumbens. Opioids micro-injected into the VTA, for example, increase dopaminergic cell firing, which subsequently increases release of dopamine within the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so opioids are excitatory too, not just inhibitory? No, the opioids increase ventral tegmental area, VTA, cell firing, increasing dopamine by inhibiting inhibitory GABA cells. This inhibition leads to increased firing and greater dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in your brain. It regulates, it keeps things quiet. When we stop telling neurons in our dopaminergic mesolimbic pathway to be quiet, they play rock and roll. This dopamine flood leads to pleasure and also, generally, to unwanted consequences. Recall that all addictions have in common a problem, a connection to reward, and a relation to dopamine. Dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, VTA, gives our nucleus accumbens, NAC, a hit of pleasure. Locus coruleus and orbitofrontal cortex areas learn that we need slash want slash crave another hit. But this circuit gets used to being active and requires more activation the next time for the same result. Why? I offer you three variants of answering why that are not exclusive to each other, and they all fall under the heading of set point theories or set point approaches to answering the question of why this happens in the system. Variant one is that our system is naturally set to give a healthy amount of pleasure. With addiction, the system downregulates its own pleasure maintenance work as it learns to expect the high external pleasure sources. Why should I do my job? You're just going to bring in pleasure from outside. The general dopamine response thus gets reduced. The locus coeruleus then reacts by sending withdrawal signals whenever you don't have the exogenous source of stimulation. In variant two, our system has set levels of two types of dopamine. Phasic, which is from the activating cell and causes a pleasure spike, and tonic, which is dopamine spilled from neighboring cells that makes a cell think it has had a pleasure spike when it hasn't. With addiction, increase in tonic dopamine reduces phasic dopamine release from the ventral tegmental area. Thereby, general dopamine response gets reduced and low dopamine leads to dysphoria and withdrawal. Variant 3, cortical areas have learned to respond more to addiction-related environmental cues. So with addiction, as the activation of pleasure spikes is getting reduced via tolerance, the activation of craving is actually getting sensitized. We want the source of our addiction more and more. And through basic Hebbian learning association, we actually like just wanting it. With behavioral addictions especially, meeting our goals can actually make us depressed if there isn't another goal to immediately replace it. Why? Because we get pleasure from the craving. The, the joy is in pursuing the want, or having the want. And under variant 3, wanting could become more rewarding than accomplishing. Think of examples of things that give you pleasure, that you want increasing amounts of, that ruin you for other things, that can distract you if someone mentions them, and that the next one can seem more important than the one you even currently have. An example I like to use is Doritos. Do Doritos taste good? Well, eating them makes you want more of them. I would say that they taste like more. It's not so much the flavor, but something makes me want them. It is a spike of the same substance that makes us want pretty much anything else that we want. 
dopamine. Returning to opioids, what determines who falls prey to the morphine molecule? Would anybody who experiences an opioid high have cravings for more? Are only a few people with addictive personalities or genes likely to get addicted? No and no. First, a reminder that dose response curves vary, so individuals can be more or less likely to have a given subjective experience in response to drugs. Layered on top of that individual difference is another individual difference that we might call your risk of misusing opioids. Two people can have similar response curves, yet different likelihoods of misusing opioids. With that said, no human's biology is immune to opioids. With continued use, craving or desire for the drug undergoes sensitization. The drug makes you want more. The neural mechanism responsible for the high or liking of the drug develops tolerance, i.e. you enjoy the high less per unit dose. When the drug is no longer present, cell function returns to normal and overshoots your basal levels. The effects of this are called withdrawal symptoms or abstinence syndrome. Opioids in general depress central nervous system function, so opioid withdrawal has been referred to as rebound hyperactivity of your central nervous system. Readministering the opioid during withdrawal would eliminate the withdrawal symptoms. Administering a different opioid drug should also stop or reduce symptoms. This is described as cross-dependence. If you no longer have withdrawal symptoms, then we say your body has been detoxed. It's important to separate here the concept of dependence from the concept of addiction. Most people being treated for chronic pain are dependent on opioids. They go into withdrawal without them. Many psychiatric clients on anti-anxiety and antidepressive medication are also chemically dependent and would experience withdrawal without their medication. This does not mean that they have abused their medication. Their chemical dependence is not the same as an addiction. The vast majority of chronic pain patients dependent on opioids do not show addictive behaviors, such as taking more than they should. Many of you listening will have chemical dependencies on medications you're taking, maybe for depression, anxiety, or pain. This chemical dependence is not itself addiction. One can be physically dependent on a substance without having abused it. Physical dependence is not synonymous with addiction. Detoxification is the first step in treatment. This can be assisted by long-acting opioids such as methadone. Methadone maintenance is the most common and effective treatment for heroin addiction. Long-term substitution of methadone for heroin relieves drug craving and allows the addict to redirect energy away from securing the drug to more productive activities. The biggest risk comes from accidental overdose at the start of the treatment. This is in part because it's difficult to determine the precise level of the individual's tolerance. This makes it difficult to choose the appropriate starting dose. Most programs require daily supervised oral administration. There are little or no euphoric effects with oral administration, and it's effective if properly dosed at mostly just relieving craving for opioids. Daily supervised administration can be quite a hassle, but it is generally preferable to the alternatives, generally withdrawal or relapse. Buprenorphine can be used in the same way as methadone. It has weaker effects and longer duration. After the initial titration period where the clinician steps up the client to the appropriate dose, administration of buprenorphine needs only to occur one to three times a week, not daily, which reduces cost and gives more freedom to the client. To reduce potential for intravenous use, buprenorphine is available as a suboxone tablet, which also contains the antagonist naloxone. When taken sublingually, i.e. when the client lets the pill dissolve under her tongue, the buprenorphine is absorbed, but the naloxone is not. But if the tablet is crushed and injected, which is what you're not supposed to do, the naloxone is there to block buprenorphine's euphoric effects. That said, Suboxone can still be abused if clients crush it up and snort it. There are other options, like implantable slow-release buprenorphine called Bropufine, and antagonists like Naltrexone, which is a longer-duration version of Naloxone, but has a few side effects, as you can imagine would be the case when you're altering your pleasure centers. 
To broaden things a bit, let's consider stimulants as our substance of choice as we explore the categories of addictive disorders. Listed here are the substance types in the DSM-5. These are the different these are the different specified substances for which one can develop use disorders and other disorders. So stimulants include methamphetamine called speed, amphetamine type stimulants like methylphenidate, cathinones and other synthetics which you may have heard by the name of bath salts and of course cocaine. The DSM doesn't just have criteria for stimulant use disorder, it also has criteria for determining uh, stimulant intoxication, which is just what it sounds like, stimulant withdrawal, since the substance has a known withdrawal syndrome, and quite a few stimulant-induced disorders as well. The top reason that people give for using stimulants is to enhance their school, work, or sport performance. The second most reported reason is to lose weight. According to page 565 of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 5th edition, most individuals with stimulant use disorder choose to smoke their stimulants, with injection being the second most popular administration method and snorting third. Also, according to page 565 of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, with continuing use, there is a diminution of pleasurable effects due to tolerance and an increase in dysphoric effects. Okay, what would it take to get a diagnosis of stimulant intoxication? All of the following. Recent use, criterion B's behavioral and physiological changes, two or more of criterion C's symptoms, and the ruling out of other explanations. If all four criteria are met, then the client qualifies for stimulant intoxication disorder. In other words, they are or were recently high. Note that this is clearly not the same as stimulant use disorder, which is the DSM-5's term for addiction to stimulants. Okay, what would it take to get a diagnosis of stimulant withdrawal? If you have recently reduced your use of stimulants, you have two or more of these criterion B symptoms, you are experiencing distress or dysfunction, and have ruled out other explanations. Then criteria have been met for stimulant withdrawal disorder. Finally, what would it take to get a diagnosis of a stimulant-induced disorder? If the client has one of these disorders, and its onset and course can be explained by and appears to depend upon stimulant use, then the client has a stimulant-induced psychiatric disorder. That's enough for now. Here is your homework. This study found that when deprived of mating, male fruit flies consume significantly more ethanol than is good for them or than they otherwise would. Why? What is your explanation as to why? Why would not getting laid have any impact on a fruit fly's drinking? More substances coming up next. Stay tuned.